morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm still on this Sunday morning. And as you heard, um, today I'm going to talk about a mystery that has vexed us for years or even decades. This is a mystery about uh, missing elements. By elements, I mean elements that make up the rocks around us and also our bodies. Now, when you hear the word mystery, you go, well, by mystery, I thought um, something that people like Agatha Christie wrote about. Now, what is so mysterious about missing elements? I mean, missing bodies would be more interesting, right? So if you're demanding things like, well, is there a death in this story? Then that gives me a hard time. How can I bring up death in the story of stars? But it so happens that, yes, I do have lots of dying stars throughout this narrative. So then I escape by a whisker from your question. But then you are demanding, isn't it? So you ask, well, that's all right, but what about you know mysteries, murders? Do you have murders in your story? And that really sends me on a fishing trip. How do I bring about murders in the story of stars? But then you have this picture here, where you see, of course, an artist's impression of two colliding stars. These happen to be neutron stars. So yes, thankfully, I can imagine murders whereby I mean one neutron star ripping apart the innards of another neutron star, yeah, killing it in the process. So yes, we do have murders of that type. And they're important, as you realize in a minute. But yes, no, you're ever so demanding, so you go on and say, no, no, no. You know, something more gruesome. How about bodies, you know, human bodies? So that is when I pull up this next slide and show you one. So what is the connection on one hand between dying stars or colliding stars, on the other hand, human bodies? And the secret lies in the composition of our bodies. So with that macabre beginning to this talk, let me lighten up the mood by telling you that you all are star matter. In other words, most of the elements in our bodies was produced in stars, in dying stars, including the most abundant element in our bodies, namely oxygen, which is actually a part of water. And you know that most living organisms have water by the loads. The other constituent of water, apart from oxygen, of course, is hydrogen. And by the way, oxygen in the human body is not limited to just the hind parts. Okay, this is just to show you how the fraction builds up. In addition to hydrogen and oxygen, we also have carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, which is not shown. But these all elements, which are of course critical to life, are relatively light. By which I mean that oxygen atoms are about 16 times the weight of hydrogen atom. Nitrogen, 14 times. Carbon, 12 times. But you know that there is also iron, you know, which is something like 56, 56 times the weight of hydrogen atom. And we need it to carry oxygen in our blood. right? But this narration doesn't end here. In fact, in addition to these elements, we also have trace heavy elements such as gold. Gold is important, although it may not be critical for supporting life. But it turns out that gold plays an important role in the health of our joints. So if you know of someone who has certain types of arthritis, chances are that he or she is being administered medication that depends on gold salts. So where were all these elements produced? Until recently, um, we knew that all the relatively light elements are produced in the core of stars. But some of the heavier ones, such as gold, um, in spite of lots of analysis, scientists were actually coming up short as um, the death of a star being the source of elements like gold or platinum, or even uranium, which of course is not found in human bodies, it is radioactive. Um, but where are they produced? This was answered recently in August 2017, when for the first time we saw the collision of two neutron stars. Okay, we saw the ripples in space that were emitted by these collisions, 
and it traveled all the way to 130 million light years to us. If you think about it, 130 million years ago, we had only dinosaurs, or primarily dinosaurs, roaming the Earth. So it took considerable amount of time, but it turns out that these distances are not the largest that we fathom in our quest for um, astrophysics. So let me begin the story by addressing where elements such as carbon, nitrogen um, are produced. This is where it helps to bring up this picture. It's a composite image of uh, telescopic pictures um, that shows the crack nebula. Uh, the spiral-like distribution of the debris of a blown up star was first observed in 1054 AD, okay, so about a millennium ago. And uh, this explosion happened within our galaxy at a distance of 6,500 light years away. How was this produced? So let us back up a bit and analyze what happens in our own star, the sun. As I speak here today, the sun in its core is fusing hydrogen to produce heavier isotopes of hydrogen and helium. Now, if you begin with a star that is at least eight times the mass of our sun, it's going to keep on fusing light nuclei to produce heavier ones such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, which we find in human bodies, all the way up to iron, which is also what we find in our blood. But once a star tries to fuse iron into something heavier, it loses thermal support because fusing iron does not produce heat unlike what fusing hydrogen does, which is why the sun is burning. It is producing heat and light. So what happens when the core of a star, which is initially only about one-fifth the size of the full star, loses its thermal support? The only other force that is active at that point is gravity, which is all attractive. So to demonstrate uh, the fate of such a star, which is in its death throes, let me use this basketball to describe a part of the core of a star. Okay. This is the core that has lost its thermal support. So all it can do is shrink. Okay. It keeps shrinking until it reaches the size of only several kilometers. At which point, quantum mechanics, which governs the behavior of subatomic particles such as neutrons and protons, which make up nuclei, takes over. So those laws halt the collapse of the core. And in fact, not just that, it helps the core rebound. Now, I cannot produce quantum mechanics in this basketball, so I cannot make this basketball rebound. So instead, what I'll do is, I'll ask you to pretend that this basketball is just some element in the core, okay? And to make, or to mimic the rebound, I'm gonna drop this ball. Okay, so as the ball bounces off the floor, you imagine this ball to be just a piece of this big core inside the star. But while this is happening, all in a fraction of a second, the outer layers of the star have not yet realized that they no longer have the support of the core underneath them. So they start falling in with a delay. So while the core material is bouncing outward, the outer layers of the star are falling inward. And what happens when the two meet? This is what we'll demonstrate by dropping these two balls. But what is your guess? What do you think will happen? Yes, I think you're right. So let's try this. But hopefully nobody will get hurt in the process. OK? I'll play it only once. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I should do it twice. OK, let's try it here. There you go. Thank you. So, do you notice that there was an explosion? And this is indeed what caused much of the star to be blown up into smithereens and then launched them with the momentum that spread this matter across space, the space pervading between neighboring stars. This is the space where eventually new stars will form with planets like Earth around them, so on. And those planets may be habitable, producing life. And life will then incorporate in it these elements that were formed in the core of the star. Okay, 
Okay, so this is a very interesting way nature uses to unlock the elements that are formed inside a star. Now, while this expansion and collision is happening, there are heavier elements also that we form, such as I mentioned urine. But the puzzle is that not enough of those heavy elements are produced. So the next question is, where are they produced? Uh, but before we move on to that, it will be important to examine what happens in such a collision. I was expecting a video to play here. There you go. So this is such an exploding star where the outer layers are being launched into space, rich with uh, heavy nuclei with lots of neutrons, and some of these nuclei are also radioactively decay, thereby producing electromagnetic emission, including visible light. But in some of these explosions, that rebounding core, you remember, it can settle down, it can recollapse partly and produce a compact object we call a neutron star. Now, a neutron star is that dead core, you know, which itself may have a mass somewhere between one to two times the mass of our sun. But all of that mass compressed in a much smaller volume with a radius that is like the radius of the city. Okay? But if you thought Puna is dense with all this swirling traffic, then think again, because this object is much more dense. So much so that a spoonful of matter, if you could scoop up from the surface, will weigh as much as Mount Everest. And if you go downwards, how big is this? Size of Pune, right? So the radius is about 10 to 13 kilometers. Not much. The sun is much, much bigger. So if you were to dig down to the center, then we expect that the density will be about twice the density of a nucleus that you see on the surface of Earth. Now, back to the case of the missing elements, right? like golden platinum. Where can they be produced? Now, if you think about this neutron star, you notice that, OK, you have a huge nucleus. I mean, the star itself can be thought of as a huge nucleus because it is comprised mostly of neutrons, okay? and, and, uh, and a constituent of a nucleus. So if you could somehow pry apart big chunks of this neutron-rich material, then maybe you can produce heavy elements. Gold atoms have a weight of about 200 times the weight of a hydrogen atom. Okay, uranium is more than that. But how would you tear this apart? The idea lies in what happens when the moon's go, moon goes around the Earth. What does it do? It raises tides. So moon is able to exert enough gravitational attraction on the Earth to make its water bodies flex, okay, stretch and stretch. But how do you do that for such a strongly gravitating tight object? And there, scientists figured that the trick is to bring close to one neutron star another neutron star, or even a black hole. Because the tidal stretching of another compact object that is very close to it, maybe only about um, another diameter away from it, can create such disruptive forces that they can break apart at least the outer layers of a neutron star. And this is the type of event that we observed in August last year, on the 17th of that month. So this is a, a simulation that is produced by solving Einstein's equation. We have two neutron stars in the simulation. And we start this animation when the two neutron stars are still several gradient apart, orbiting around each other. But the orbit shrinks because the system loses its gravitational ener energy in the form of ripples in the curvature of space-time, which we also call gravitational waves. But as they come close by, and before they, in fact, coalesce, you notice that some of the material from these two neutron stars gets disrupted and spewed across space. It is this material that is rich in neutrons, loads and loads of neutrons which again can break radioactively or with nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is something we use in our thermonuclear reactors to produce energy. So this fissile material will also produce energy and light. The question is, did we, in addition to the ripples that were observed by LIGO and Virgo detectors last year, also observe electromagnetic radiation expected 
from such decay and fission. Because that will then give us evidence for the production of heavy elements. And the answer is yes, we did. This is a picture taken by DCAM, which stands for the Dark Energy Camera, um, about half to one and a half days after we got the gravitational signal in LIGO. Um, and you see the emission in the form of this part um, in its host galaxy, the brightest image here. And the host galaxy happens to be what we call NGC 4993, uh, another of those unimaginative names that astronomers uh, come up with. This is in the direction of the constellation of Hydra, 130 million, uh, million light years, as I mentioned before. But how do we know that this is not a you know, nearly everlasting star? That is because when this camera waited for a couple of weeks and observed it again, the emission was gone. This was again predicted by astrophysicists to be something that should happen as this fissile material exhausts um, its um, fuel. So this is one puzzle that we landed up solving. So this is the type of NOVA that produces elements such as platinum and gold. Um, but it also throws up new challenges that we have not solved yet. For example, um, members of my group were involved in studying other types of electromagnetic emissions, such as radio waves. And the radio waves are still being emitted by whatever lies um, optically invisible in that spot in the sky. So what is the cause of this emission? We have some answers, but not complete answers. Similarly, high energetic photons, or light particles in the form of X-rays, are also being emitted from that spot. Not showing up here because this is not showing X-ray emission. So the reason behind such emissions is something that we partially understand. We hope to understand them better in the future. And who knows, maybe one of the members of the audience will contribute to that understanding and may then speak about it at a future TED Talk somewhere near a venue uh, close by. Thank you.